I really want that lapel pin. <clears throat> Meet Rudolf II, Holy Roman Emperor of the 16th century. Depending on how many drinks you've had so far, you may notice something's a little bit weird about this painting. <laughs> and that's appropriate, because Rudolf II was also rather odd. History remembers Rudolf II as one, owning one of the most eclectic and remarkable collections of his day. Two, becoming one of the greatest patrons the arts and sciences have ever known. There's gonna be more of that. Good practice. And three, starting 30 years of war. Oops, you can't win them all. Now, given that Rudolph chose to have himself immortalized with fruits and vegetables, tonight I'll be telling his story with the help of a friend, the apple. And before we get into what made Rudolph, let's take a, de a brief detour into what Rudolf made, or rather, what he accumulated. We'll start by jumping ahead to Rudolf's later life, because the fun stuff is in his Kunstkammer, his cabinet of curiosities. And this was a bit of a misnomer in Rudolf's case, because that cabinet was an entire wing of his palace, where he housed 470 paintings, 179 objects of ivory, 600 vessels of agate and crystal, 174 ceramic pieces, several thousand coins and medals, 185 works of precious stone. You get the idea. This guy was also a bit of a hoarder. And that's not even counting the over 300 mathematical instruments and all manner of machines from watches and celestial globes to perpetual motion machines and even intricate automatons designed to serve drinks. We would have felt right at home in this palace. But we wouldn't have had the opportunity because while this was a brilliant collection and an obvious display of wealth, Rudolf didn't put it on display. Despite his very public position, he was a private individual. And for him, the Kunstkammer was a kind of therapy. He was known to sit and stare at the objects in his collection for hours. And in times of great distress, Rudolf would take his unicorn horn <laughs> and his holy grail and draw a magic circle around himself with a Spanish sword, as you do. So he was a bit quirky. And part of his quirkiness may have come from his lineage. The Habsburgs had controlled <laughs> the Habsburgs had controlled much of Europe since the 1400s, and fearful that they'd lose their reign, they spent centuries sleeping with each other, so as not to taint the bloodline with outsiders. Of course, taint the bloodline is exactly what that behavior did. So Rudolf may have suffered some mental instability as the result of his family's imperial inbreeding. Add to that the tension of his direct family. Despite being first cousins, Rudolf's parents couldn't have been more different. <laughs> his father, Maximilian, was a pretty fun-loving guy, really easygoing and a relatively tolerant leader for the time. His mother, Maria, was just the opposite. She was cold and harsh, and she had given birth to 16 of Maximilian's children, so she had no time or interest for cuddles or coddling. <laughs> As a devout Catholic, Maria feared the heathen joys of Vienna would distract Rudolf from a pious youth. So when he was 11, she sent him to Spain to receive a formal education from his very religious uncle, Philip II. Philip's charming pastimes included collecting dead people, burning people alive, and long walks on the beach. <laughs> Just kidding about that last one. Unfortunately, not kidding about the other two. Uncle Philip made sure Rudolph was constantly surrounded by morose reminders of their faith. His palace was basically a mausoleum. He kept the bodies of 103 martyrs just down the hall from the bedrooms. 
He had amassed thousands of holy relics, like a hair from Christ's beard, a thorn from his crown, part of a handkerchief used by the Virgin Mary and stained with her tears. Clearly all legit. But Philip also had some genuine masterpieces, like Hieronymus Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights and Titian's The Burial of Christ. So being surrounded by all these unique objects probably inspired some of Rudolph's passion for collecting later in life. And then there's that whole burning people alive bit. Philip was a huge fan of the Spanish Inquisition. He used it as a way to destroy anybody who didn't agree with his philosophies, his politics, pretty much anyone he didn't like. And he brought his young nephew along to watch as he had these heretics burned alive. Rudolf, reasonably so, found this experience repulsive. He did not agree with the church's contempt for those that didn't agree with their views, and he did not believe that people should be persecuted for their differences. This ideology would come into play during his leadership later in life. Now, after eight years in Spain, Rudolf was allowed to return to Vienna, and his uncle sent him off with a letter that basically said, read the Bible every day, and don't read any other books, you heathen. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that sent Rudolf running to find the Vatican's banned book list. And all of this experience was pretty heavy for a teenager. So when he returned home to Vienna at age 19, he was sullen and somber. And though he had no interest in politics, his fate was sealed. In his early 20s, his father Maximilian passed away, and as the eldest surviving son, he was crowned the new emperor. He celebrated by having a mental breakdown. <laughs> Panic attacks, depression, he was unable to eat or sleep. It didn't help matters that the empire Rudolf inherited was not a happy one. Throughout the empire, religious factions had splintered off, and they were battling it out with the Catholic Church. And while Rudolf was technically Holy Roman Emperor, each section of the empire had its own individual rulers, which created all kinds of political tension. Meanwhile, you have the Ottoman Empire right next door, ready to pop in for a visit at any point. So TLDR, there's a lot of responsibility in this Holy Roman Emperor gig, and frankly, Rudolf just wanted to sit at home and stare at his shiny objects. <laughs> His attempts to unite the religious factions only made the region more vulnerable, and eventually he kind of gives up on any semblance of leadership and moves his residence from Vienna to Prague, where he can avoid that nasty government business. Prague was a city with a history for religious dissent. A century earlier, the Hussites had initiated a movement against the Catholic Church that preceded the Reformation. So having distanced himself from both the church and politics, Rudolf focused his time in Prague on finding new perspectives, and art. During this era, his collection and the city of Prague flourished. He invited scientists, artists, and even mystics, <laughs> mystics, from all over to come to Prague. Rudolf wanted all the ideas. It was this acceptance that created a safe haven from the church's critical eye, fostering a space where people could explore their curiosities without fear of persecution. And he became fascinated with alchemy, astronomy, and the occult. Mystical works made their way into his collection, like alchemical guides to finding the Philosopher's Stone, the Voynich Manuscript illustrated with curious drawings of mechanical di diagrams and bathing beauties, written in an indecipherable language and the Devil's Bible, said to be written in collaboration with Satan. <laughs> Satan. Now, remember, this is the late 1500s, and it's during an era of great religious scrutiny, so it's likely that these items would have been banned for sure, maybe even burned and destroyed had they fell into the hands of the Catholic Church. But Rudolf, he wanted to collect them all. And even more than the objects he owned, his most treasured possessions were the people he acquired. His court hired John Dee, Tycho Bray, Josef Kepler, Elizabeth Jane Weston, and many of the most celebrated Mannerist artists of the 16th century. Speaking of artists, let's return to that wacky painting. At first glance, it looks like a farce. And let's face it, Rudolf was a bit of a fruity guy. 
<laughs> but the artist, the very talented Giuseppe Archimboldo, was actually honoring his patron. The piece portrays Rudolph as the god of metamorphosis, vertumnus, and the cornucopia of vegetables represents the prosperous growth of the intellectual era that thrived under the emperor's rule. But flowers can only flourish for so long before the seasons change, and by the time he reached his 50s, Rudolph's mental state was really beginning to deteriorate. He became reclusive and no longer engaged in state discussions at all. He developed a paranoia that someone was out to get him, and he wasn't too off the mark. You see, he had never agreed to marry, and there was no succession plan in place, so when the Habsburgs got really nervous about his off-kilter mental state, they agreed as a family to dethrone him, and his younger brother took over the reins behind his back. Holed up in his castle, Rudolf became ill and died within a year. And shortly thereafter, the political and religious tensions of the region snapped, and many historians became, uh, believe that Rudolf's disconnected rulership is responsible for the several decades of turmoil that followed, what would come to be known as the Thirty Years' War. As a spoil of that war, Rudolf's incredible collection was dispersed. Whether you believe he's responsible for the war or not, there's a general consensus that Rudolf II didn't excel as a leader. He made poor political decisions, and he kept himself secluded away from both his subjects and his political strategists. But he was also a catalyst for the ideas that fueled the scientific revolution. Revolution. He possessed political power by birthright, but he sought intellectual power. And he wanted to unlock the secrets of the universe, but he wanted to keep that to himself. So it's ironic that his selfish quest for knowledge ended up destroying the power that he did have, and the rest of us now benefit from his pursuits. So while we will never receive an invitation into Rudolf's Kunstkammer, we do have a window into the secrets of his magic circle. Through the many talented people that he supported and the marvels of art and science that they created. So let's drink, not to Rudolf II per se, but to his curiosity and to the ideas that it inspired. Cheers. So um, I get the privilege of asking, now that you've done the thing and you've done all the things, we would like to have you as the first fellow of 2018. Will you join us? Yeah. 